Hello and welcome. Welcome poetry fans. Welcome fans of literature. This is Ulta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood and I am the digital editor of Ulta Journal. I am so excited to welcome you today to our second in our Writers on Writers series that we are doing at Ulta Live throughout the month of October. We, um, this idea was kind of pitched by assistant editor Jessica Blau. Why don't we have two writers in conversation with one another, both working in similar genres um, and it kind of take me or another moderator out of the equation and bring two writers together from our current holiday guide. Um, and so that's what we're doing here today. So, so the, the kind of the, today's theme is poetry. Forrest Gander and Tay Tibble may be separated by continents and perhaps decades, but this pair of writers are connected by their mutual devotion to a poet's life. Their individual bodies of work reflect an urgency and a desire to welcome readers into the intimate parts of their minds, or at least get those parts on the page. Today's conversation between Tay and Forrest um, we'll kind of explore the embodiment and provocative motion, emotions of their poetry, look at translation and language, um, and kind of, I'm going to kind of toss it over to them and let them talk about really whatever they want. Briefly about them, Forrest Gander is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. You may have know his book, Be With, um, and core samples from the world. He is a noted translator. He's a California native, and he lives up here in Northern California. Tay is the author of Pocahontas and is joining us from the future. She is in Wellington, New Zealand, where it is currently Thursday. Um, and she has completed a master's degree in creative writing from the International Institute of Modern Letters, Victoria University of Wellington, where she was the recipient of the Adam Foundation Prize in Creative Writing. Um, if you're not, if you you might be familiar with them, but if you don't know about Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly journal focused on California and the West. Our current issue out now, issue 25, is the writer's issue. It features a lot of really exciting stories, as well as a, a real centerpiece focused on the art of the word, the extraordinary process, the power of literature, um, everything from nine things, nine awkward things that happened at writers groups to what it's like to be on a book tour, to what it's like to be Alta's books editor, David Ulin. He's a novelist and a teacher and he does a million things. Anyway, check it out. It's also got inside our holiday guide. If you like what we do, I hope you will consider joining us as a member for $3 a month for a digital membership, $50 a year for an annual membership. We've got free events like this. California Book Club is also free. Um, so we've got a lot of exciting stuff going on. Check us out. Finally, this interview will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later this afternoon. We will also include links to where you can buy Pocahontas and Forest Books Forrest's book, not, as well as links to their work in Alta, um, anything else that happens to pop up throughout their conversation. You can ask questions in the chat. In fact, please do. Have I freed up the chat yet? Yes. Let us know um, where you're zooming in from in the chat. If you can, it's always fun to see that. Um, and I think it might be fun before I, I let it go to um, have each of you begin by reading a short poem. So Tay, if it's cool with you, why don't you start us off? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Kia ora tātou, ko te whanau āpuni mi Ngāti Pro te iwi ko uh, te whanganui a tāra on te roa ahau ko Tay Tibble tuku ingoa. My name's Tay Tibble and I'm going to read a poem from the latest issue of Alta called Wayfinders. Wayfinders. My ancestors knew the exact distance between the stars and still had the desire to risk it all anyway. Voyaging to the horizon where this world meets the next, feeling for the boundary and pushing the sky out even further. And I think about this when my want keeps wanting yours, when I look up at the sky and pick the exact same star that you are standing under. I feel us like te kore, compass against my chest, text vibrating with potential and in the distance the crackle of chaos, the universe being ripped apart like a bag of chips, starving, animal, schoolboy, wild, or could be if we're dumb and godlike enough to drag ourselves into light. Over cocktails at Ascot, I whisper my premonitions to Miriamma, goddess of the sea, 
who reminds me that every hopeful star skimmed across ocean causes ripples. And the thing about water is you can never quite predict what kind of reaction you will get. Perhaps it will lie down flat like a lover and give you highways to drive your hands over, or it might assume the shape of tsunami, tanifa, you can't prepare for. So think about which wishes you wish to rip from the sky before you throw them burning wide into the land of the living. Just because you are made of that brave waving stock doesn't mean you should do or take anything you want. And I think about this when my want keeps wanting yours, when I think I can cheat the distance and conjure you to me through the cables that map the sea floor. We stand on different sides of many oceans and here at the center of my ancestors creation is where I belong. But every now and then I hope you think of me on the beach with my girlfriends dripping in bone, stone and gold. Your waves crashing quietly on my shores, my eyes on our horizon searching for your birds. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. All right, Forrest. Are you, I'm gonna share. So <clears throat> this poem is from the book Knot and it's a collaboration with the photographer, Jack Shear. So this is the first, uh, first poem. <clears throat> Exhausted, I can't climb anymore. Yet I could possibly hang here for a moment, stop this exertion, just cling, catching my breath to this cascade of long, dark hair, which she has let down from the window. The window that didn't look nearly so high, only balcony level, wasn't it, when I started those hours ago? Haven't I been climbing for hours above me? My overextended arms quiver and ache all the way down to their sockets. The round swollen muscles of my shoulders press to my ears. Is she calling? I can't hear. When I look up, I see the cascade of her long hair, nothing beyond that. But it's as difficult to pause as to climb. So I keep going. To tell the truth, I never paused. Deaf and blind, I keep tugging myself up into that falling blackness. I, who am bringing her the moon. Lovely. Both of you. With that uh -huh. incredible opener, I am going to get lost and turn this conversation over to you. Audience, I will appear back at the end with any questions on your behalf. Um, Forrest and Tay. Take it away. All right. Hey, Tay. Hi, Forrest. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Well, it, it seems in light of the horrors going on in Israel right now, which seems impossible not to mention today, and which remind us of our species' inexhaustible capacity for violence against our own kind, I wanted to ask you a question about another violence connected to your book and your own history. So when you mentioned the White Capto Wars in the subtitle of an early poem in Pocahontas, you follow the example of Ezra Pound who never footnoted his historical or cultural references. Your own imagination of a mother in the White Capto fleeing through the woods it's all you give us of that moment in New Zealand history. And it's all we'll know about Waikato unless we look it up, in which case we discover that the colonial invasion of Waikato, a territory near Auckland, pitted 14,000 colonial troops against 4,000 Maori warriors. And it was the largest and perhaps most devastating single colonial campaign in 19th century New Zealand. But I wanted to ask you why you chose not to contextualize or footnote those references for your U.S. audience. Um, well, I, th I think it was um, mostly to do with the fact that the book came out in Aotearoa first. And in Aotearoa, <laughs> like, I just really want to make the conscious decision not to 
footnote or or have translations for anything for the principle that I didn't want to make anything with my culture or the Māori culture seem othered in the land um, uh, on the whenua. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't really think about it so much in the US context. Maybe maybe, maybe it would have been nice to have footnotes, but at the same time, like, um, I don't know, if people are curious, they can, they can Google it and look it up kind of thing. Exactly. I, I'm really glad you didn't footnote that. And I'm going to ask you about the language that you um, you drop in also, because um, because I'm interested in the kind of reader that doesn't say, oh, I don't know that word. And so I'm dropped out of the poem and I don't want to look anything up um, because I, I want more more interested readers in my work and your work exactly. and everybody can look it up and if we footnote things then it becomes like a document or you know some kind of academic thing yeah so, i think i had that resistance too i didn't want it to feel academic i i I'd, before i i done an undergraduate degree in history was my ba and you know i just was so sick of footnotes by the time that i got out of there i just didn't want to do any more and i think if i yeah, I think for poetry, especially when you're footnoting, it's just, it makes it heavy on the page, um, which I wanted to avoid. And I feel like if I, for the American audiences, if I went ahead and footnoted or translated, you know, it would be really dense. There's just like, my my work is so rooted in my culture and my country. Like, it would just, there'd be so much I would have to, have to footnote if I was going to go there. So it's easier to just not footnote at all. And yeah. People, yeah. Yes. I think once we become poets, we can say no more footnotes, except when, I mean, some poets, Jenny Booley in the United States and Sheikh Keen, the Caribbean poet, has a great book called uh, One a Day with Water, but their footnotes are totally creative. It's like where the poetry really happens. That's something different. Um, yeah, and I've read some books where the footnotes have, yeah kind of been the best part of the of the writing to be honest but uh -huh. yeah maybe, maybe another book yeah um yeah um I mean yeah language like going off the language language is like um well the use of different languages is something that's important to me but I know that you also um do a lot of translations and Spanish and Japanese as well? Uh, I co-translate from Japanese. I studied Japanese and I sound really good for about a minute. <laughs> Crick out. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, like, you know, using these different languages, like, what do you, what do you get from, um, yeah, I guess being able to use different languages and does it influence your use of English or <laughs> the other languages that you're using? Yeah, sure. I think tr translation, um, you know, I think of translation as the deepest kind of reading and also the deepest kind of listening to, um, to the music in someone else's mind. You have to be able to hear that to begin to translate it into your own language. And then you're um, making discoveries in you know, image repertoires and syntactical things that can happen in other languages that um, that we can adopt and can be um, sort of add to our, our our wingspan in our own language. So translating has been um, really generative for me in lots of ways, um, in, including the connection to people in another culture, which um, which is one of the things that's enriched my life so much. Um, but that makes me think of a question that I uh, want to ask you, um, because they're sort of different language things. Let me see if I can find it. Um, that, that happen at the same time in your work. Um, Okay, so um, 
Well, one of the things I'm thinking of is that in some of your work, um, there's a there's a kind of ecological sensibility. And um, I wish I could find a, a quote, but, um, for instance, um, so sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm not finding. Um, so there's an ecological sensibility. You talk about feeling for the earth and listening for the earth. You drop your clothes like bark you say at one point, and one feels a connection with um, between the human and the non-human very much in your work. And that's a kind of philosophical point of view. But at the same time, um, there are other poems where, um, I mean, the energy in Pocahontas is wild, but the wildness gets a dose of adrenaline in the next book, your newest book, um, which begins with these buzzy poems using slang and hip hop contractions and slash marks. And it's focused on teenage swagger and club scenes, drugs, cops, love, spe love spells, making, you say, scenes of yourselves, waking up in bathtubs. So how do you relate that fast life with the ecological consciousness that happens in other poems? How do you hold that together? And think of them together? Um, I think it just comes from my perspective and my background. Like, I feel like a lot of my work is from the perspective of being urban Māori or bougie native or a city native. I don't know if those are terms you can live in the US. Um, obviously, I have, like, being Indigenous, you know, there's lots of kinship with with the land and especially with the earth like you know we, we regard the earth as being Papa Tuanuku the first mother and we all believe that we're descendants from her and um yeah and there's obviously just so many indigenous cultures most of the culture is like centered around uh the preservation and, and being kaitiaki the guardianship of and guarding the earth um but like my and but I've been living I live in the capital city of New Zealand and I've been here for four generations, my grandmother moved here um, from our tribal lands up on the east coast of New Zealand um, just after World War II. So I feel very at home here as well. Um, and yeah, I just think it's just natural for me. That's like the way I've been brought up and I see the world is from this axis point of Māori tanga and modernity. Um, but yeah, and I really enjoy like emphasizing that perspective as well. I think there's a lot of natural tension in having this kind of cross section of cultures that makes for really can make for interesting poetry. Just the kind of the clash, um, yeah. which which of cultures, which is what I like to put and like see on the page. I guess yeah. Yeah, yeah um, that line I was looking for before it, it comes from the new book Rangakura. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Rangikura. Rangakura where you say you developed an early kind of kinship slash with all the ways the earth hurt. I was touched by that line. Um, so, but in, uh, if we go back to Pocahontas, the, those, those people who haven't read it are in for a super treat. Um, the first writing in Pocahontas is an essay with a wink in its title. It's not titled an essay about indigenous do's and don'ts. It's titled an essay about indigenous hairdos and don'ts. And in the first paragraph, you link two culturally and historically discordant realms by associating your Maori grandmother with the Egyptian Cleopatra. So at the very start, it seems you mean to waylay any expectations your readers might have about the book presenting some familiar narrative and a point of view regarding identity politics. Is that right? I think so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that poem's like such an amalgamation. There's so many different codes and images and layers and like just, there's a lot in that poem, it's quite dense. Um, and I think, yeah, it was kind of putting that also at the front of the book was like my way of kind of, I guess, signposting that you know, 
this book is going to contain a lot and, and I feel like you know even though I think I do write from my fucker papa my ancestry at my core like I still feel like everything is up for grabs for me and accessible to me and I want to put that on the page that poem also was like I wrote that book when I was doing my master's and that was probably I wrote that poem very very early on it was like the first it was literally probably the first poem I ever wrote kind of about indigeneity and and my family history and colonization at large and I remember like it being the poem that everyone was like really responded to and was kind of told me this is what you should be trying to write towards so yeah it was quite significant in putting me on this path that I've been on since yeah yeah amalgamation seems like a good word that you used for for part, some of your techniques uh -huh. jamming things together and often at a very fast pace to keep that because it's both books are just alive with energy yeah yeah I am um, yeah I definitely I think cadence is probably like my favorite driver or like mode of poetry it's like the thing that I probably look for and concentrate on the most and I think that kind of comes from my language my indigenous language I didn't grow up, I'm not fluent in Te Māori, but I use a lot of kupu and Māori words in my poetry. Um, but I grew up listening to a lot of um, like waiata songs and more tia tia traditional Māori poetry, which has this like constant chant um, rhythm to it. And even though like I can't, can't necessarily quote it or speak fluently, I still feel like that language is really in, like gratiated in me. And um, wait, I'm going to like, this is kind of, I'm having this weird thought for this weird yarn, but when I was over your guys' way on the West Coast in November, where I met you, um, yeah. I had, I was, I was up the line in Coast Salish country and I went to the premiere of this film, The Salmon People, with some, with my Coast Salish friend and they were, they had like traditional dancing and they were playing their traditional drums and I was like, suddenly got really hyper fixated on their drumming and I was like found it really weird because there's so many drums in Polynesian or and in, sorry indigenous cultures including Polynesian and Pacific cultures like Samoan, Tahitian, Cook Island but Māori we don't have any drums and uh. I was thinking why is this like it's pretty weird like we had like I'm sure we had the, enough and the correct animals to be able to make a drum skin but we just never had any drums I think um and I was trying to ask my friends like why don't we have why don't we have any drumming? And then they were like, well, we keep the rhythm in other ways. Like we either, like in the haka, the slapping of the chest or the stamping of the foot. But I think just the way our consonants and the way our language actually sounds itself is how we keep a rhythm. And I, yeah, I, sorry, I went on a weird yarn, but um, <laughs> that's what I'm really yeah. drawn, and drawn to, that rhythm. And it's what I listen for. It's like what my ear like recognizes as being music or poetry is this kind of cadence that I have right throughout my poems. Yeah. Um, but I'm going on about myself, but I wanted to ask you about, um, yeah, talk to you about not. Um, yeah, it's, it's all, well, I've got a bunch of questions about not, but the first thing is like, I'm like really interested in like the ways in which poets can collaborate because, you know, writing such like, usually such a, a solitary, and weird things like you and your fragments of your weird thoughts <laughs> a lot yeah. of the time by myself feeling crazy like how did ha like how did your collaboration come about like did the like how did you meet the photographer did the photos pre-exist and what, what was the I guess the artistic impulse or attraction that made you commit to wanting to do a book okay I'm going to answer that question but a couple of things you bring up on the way that writing as a solitary activity it's going to bring me back to thinking about your poetry, which is so often about friends and friendships. That seems to be one of the big themes in your poetry. And then I also want to ask you, while you were talking about language, about, um, about the place of Māori in, um, in New Zealand now. But as for my own collaboration with Jack Shear, I, I, I collaborate with lots of artists, and it turns out I've collaborated with a, a lot of photographers 
um, Sally Mann and uh, Graciela Iturbide in, in Mexico and um, Lucas Foley in the United States. Jack Shearer um, saw some of those collaborations. He was he was Ellsworth Kelly's husband. So he's been very connected to the art world for a long time. And he asked me if I might be interested in writing some poems to these images, all of um, naked men wrestling with this huge black cloth. So sometimes you see only the cloth and sometimes you see just part of a body and um, so he sent me lots of photographs and I chose the ones that I felt most inclined to write about. And one of the things I really like about collaboration um, is that it, um, in giving up some of the control, um, you discover things that you wouldn't have discovered on your own um, just by writing as you usually write. So I find collaboration um, generative artistically and also a good social model of how we can cooperate with other people to make something creative. So that thing, two, two, it looks like we're coming down to time. Two quick questions for you about, one about the place of friendship in your work and then the other, for lots of us in the US who don't know that much about the history of New Zealand, um, Maori was the dominant language of New Zealand uh, um, for until the 1800s. Um, but the number of people speaking te rao Maori, is that what you say, has yes. steadily declined since then. Um, but there have been recent efforts to revitalize the language. I wonder if you think that it does have a chance of being um, revitalized and used as even a principal language of New Zealand. And were you ever able to take Maori language classes or did you mostly pick it up through the culture and your grandmother? <clears throat> and are there um, Maori people writing poets that you know who write in just Maori te rao? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we definitely, colonization definitely tried to take the language from us and have us not speak it um and there was definitely yeah a lapse where it was very close to extinction like my I was raised partially by my great-grandmother and she was of the generation where you know you were hits and told you weren't allowed to speak Māori at school so they didn't have the um they didn't think you know didn't have the impetus to pass it down to their kids they thought it was you know um only going to get them into trouble kind of thing um, but there was yeah big language revitalization efforts in the seminaries, and honestly like there's it's it's there's been a big push like of the last recent years. I think it I think I think we're kind of on a good stretch. Like people are becoming increasingly bilingual, and even the culture is just very bilingual at the moment. Like, and it's kind of been like that for a while. Like there are, you know, there are lots of words that not even Maori would use, that Pakia and non Maori would use as well instead of the English. It's just like. A natural natural to use the te reo Māori word instead of the English word in a lot of instances um but this might be changing soon because we're about to have our election like I think next weekend and it looks huh. like the other stuff's gonna get in and I don't know if they're gonna be pushing the language revitalization but I think like yeah like we I wasn't I didn't grow up with te reo in schools but I think I think there's te reo in schools now um so yeah there's been lots of um push and you know, we have this saying, kafai fai tonu maso, which means the struggle without end. And like, we've always been fighting for our rights to self-determination and for our culture. So I just, I, I personally don't feel um, like there's any risk in us losing our language because we'll just keep fighting for it kind of thing. Um, and that's yeah. a phrase, the one phrase you just used is one that comes up in, in your book, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, well, what was that? My me, my me. Um, first of all, this is I it is now my turn to interrupt. I'm so sorry, but um I'm so this is such a poetic and international. I feel like we're traveling the globe together. Um, it's lovely. I do want to ask a few questions before we wrap it up on behalf of the audience. Um, Forrest, let's start with you. We'll just kind of go Forrest Tay. Um, can you just 
what's the process like? What is forced? What is your process like? Do you say, I'm going to sit down and write a poem right now at eight o'clock in the morning and take laptop to fingers and make it ha magic happen? Or like, what does your process look like? It's, it's changed all through my life. It's really um, different now. At, at some points in my life, when I was raising a child, I did wake up really early and go out and write before anyone was up. And it was really regular that way. And I love that because I'm sort of a person of ritual. But um, now it's much more haphazard. And a lot of the, I don't, I don't ever just sit down and, and with a blank page and write a poem because I've been keeping notes and notebooks um, all the time. And it usually, that's that's what become a generative text where something in my notebooks will strike me um, in terms of its theme or image or its rhythm and and then I'll think of how that could be connected and then other things will begin to fall into place the way it is when you learn a new word and all of a sudden you hear it all the time after that um, that's that's sort of how it happens for me now. What about you, Tay? How do you, what's your process like? I think my process is pretty similar to Forrest. Like it's been different at different points or different points of the process. Like when I'm been working on the collection and it's like pretty formed or nearly done, then it's a lot more, I like to implement a lot more routine and structure to try and get it done. More hours, I would say, but outside of that like when in the phase I'm in now it's like yeah it's more about like collecting or making notes and yeah little having little fragments I do try and write every day but sometimes it just means opening up that document where I have all my bits in and just having a little tattoo or play around and then other times it's like writing more um, generatively or doing editing but I do try and open the document at least once a day, but it's really random on how much I actually get done. So that it's, seems to contribute to what you were talking about, your sort of amalgamation um, poetry, which I think is, in, in your case, is so exciting because it keeps the, the readers um, off balance. When we're expecting one thing, something else comes in. and. Um, I like being unsettled by your poetry. Thank you. Yeah, no, I definitely want it to be surprising and not predictable. And that's what I read for as well. Mm -hmm. The poets I like have funny or weird shifts. And yeah, that's what's exciting to me to read. Janet asks, um, Janet's a novel, Janet Clare is a novelist with a second book to be published. And so she's kind of wondering if she could now call herself a writer. When did you both recognize yourselves as poets? When did you get to say, yeah, I really am. I'm a real poet. Could it was there a moment? Do you there still not moment. think you're a real poet? Forrest, we'll start with you. Okay. Forrest, you're up, go first. Oh, okay. Are you a real poet? Yeah, I don't know. I think anybody's a poet who calls themselves a poet. I wouldn't argue with them. But for me, there was a real moment when I thought I was a hotshot poet in high school. And I got to college my freshman year. And I met a, I had a, a, an appointment with my English teacher, Professor Jenkins. And I showed him some poems to sort of yeah, read these and weep, Professor. And he read a couple and he looked up at me with these sad basset hound eyes and said, Forrest, these are terrible. <laughs> and that was a great moment for me because until then I hadn't been reading contemporary poetry and suddenly I thought, oh, this isn't just about my feelings and I need to learn the art. And I began reading contemporary poetry much more um, seriously. And that helped me on my way to become a poet. What about you, Tay? Are you, are you a that's, poet? That's funny. It's kind of, yeah, I kind of had a similar experience. Like 
Wow. I was like writing a lot of poems and putting them on the internet on like Tumblr and Wattpad when I was a teenager. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a poet. I've always been like fully convinced that this is what I was going to do. I was like serious as, pretentious as about it. Um, yeah, thought I was thought I was really hot shit. And then um, when I, I did my undergrad and then I applied to do the masters before I'd finished my undergrad, I was kind of being a little punk at that point in my life. Like I was like a hard, a hearty stoner. I was kind of failing out of my undergrad, but I still applied to do my master's anyway. Got in under the false pretense that I was going to finish my BA before I started. Didn't finish my BA. And then when I got into the master's, like the first day, I remember my professor like pulled me aside and was like, Tay, your palms are kind of, your palms are kind of, your palms kind of suck at the moment. <laughs> no, nah, she didn't say it. In the, she said that. <laughs> no, that was the message, not the words. Your palms suck and you better take this seriously. And I was like, I love how you both have a humble okay, moment. There is yeah. there's a, the, a hum, you know, the hot shit thing is very consistent. And then the fall. Humble thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think we um, need like every artist, like and poet needs a bit of ego, but you also need to be very like open to being humbled by the universe too. <laughs> Um, before we wrap it up, I have a last, I, kind of a final question for one of you. I know it, so we do at Alta, we do a ton of um, events with authors, some of whom are comfortable reading from their work. Sometimes they don't want to. Um, when I speak with artists, some artists are very comfortable describing their work, talking about it. Others say, you know, I'm not really open to being interviewed or discussing my art. How, in terms of I know that reading your poetry or being in front of people, Tay, in fact, before we began, you were like, this Zoom thing is not my comfort zone. You're, you're more comfortable feeling the live energy. And Forrest, I've seen you read in person and you you very much have an energy when you're reading your own work. Are, do you both feel that there's kind of a performance element of poetry or there, there's an aspect of, of speaking your poetry in front of people that, I don't know, makes that kind of uh, is it is that part of it special to you is that an important part of your work as a poet it is to me um I had there's a poet here called Apirana Taylor and he told me like very early on in my career like you know you have to read your poems with the mana they deserve um mana meaning like the honor or prestige and like that way you honor yourself you honor the poems and most importantly you honor the people who are listening to you and I've like always, yeah, taken that with me since I heard that. Wow. Forrest? Well, I think poetry originates, you know, in the body, that it's a bodily art, that even when people read to themselves, um, scientists say our, our voice box is moving up and down, that our bodies are involved. Um, so I like both aspects of it. I also something that San Francisco poet says, George Oppen says, it's very easy to, um, to, to trust your reading out loud, but it has to work on the page uh, mm -hmm. as well. It doesn't for everyone, but I want mine to as well. Well, it does. Both of you, um, the connection in real life and on the page is, is very deep and profound. So thank you both. Forrest Gander and Tay Tibble for joining our second in the Writers on Writers series. Fantastic conversation. Folks, before you leave, don't. Um, next week, we're going we're gonna to take a totally different journey with noir and mystery writers. Todd Goldberg and David L. Ulin will join us. Um, that's a week from today. And then next, next Thursday, um, I think that's October 26th, we will welcome... Um, Lydia Kiesling and C. Pam Zhang, both of whom have really hotly anticipated second novels coming out. So we're going to talk to them about that. Um, again, Pocahontas by Tay Tibble, not by Forrest Gander. We're going to send you links to buy both of those at bookshop. Subscribe to Alta. And subscribe to Alta. Thank you, Forrest. Um, yeah. So, and, and thank you to, to everyone at Alta and to bookshop.org and to both of your, um, both Forrest and Tay for promoting Alta and being such great champions of the work we do. We're so grateful um, to you both and to our audience. So thanks everyone. Take care. Hey, great to see you, Beth. Thank you. Hey, good to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I feel like I hogged. I didn't get to No, you were both awesome. Excellent work. Brilliant. We'll see you soon. Take care all.